Okay, so um, <clears throat> the first thing I'd like to say is that if you've looked at the um, printed program, uh, you might be scared that I'm going to talk for one hour and 45 minutes, but um, that is a typo. So this lecture should end at 12.15, so there should still be time uh, for lunch. So let me begin by um, reminding you what we um, did yesterday. So we saw um, an existence theorem for Kovanov homology. Uh, then using uh, the theorem, we deduced some, some properties. We uh, made a connection with the Jones polynomial. And we saw that there was a reduced version. Um, and I was in the middle of um, telling you that there was an also an integral version, um, and uh, I said that the integral version also had a, uh, both a reduced and an unreduced uh, variant, um, but the relationship between the two was somewhat more complicated, namely there was a long exact sequence uh, relating the two. And um, as uh, um, Robert just said, um, Kovanov homology shows up a lot of torsion um, in, the, in the integral theory. And um, <coughs> one of the things is that a lot of that torsion is two torsion. If you look at the tables of calculations, which you can do, if you want to see some calculations of Kovanov homology, um, just the results, you can look at the Knot Atlas. It's a, there's a wealth of data on the Knot, knot Atlas. And there you'll see the integral version of uh, Kovanov homology calculated for many uh, many knots. And you will visibly see um, that, that, that there is a lot of um, two torsion. Uh, you'll struggle a little bit more to see odd torsion, um, but certainly there'll be a lot of two torsion. And one of the um, points about the two torsion is that a lot of it actually does come from the passage from reduced to unreduced. The one of the, the co-boundary map in that long exact sequence that I wrote up yesterday um, is zero mod two, and that's responsible for a lot of the two torsion. And in fact, if you look at the reduced version of the integral theory, I think you have to, the first um, knot that has two torsion is maybe has 13 crossings or something like that. Whereas if you um, look at the tables of the unreduced, the first calculations you really look at, the trefoil even, you see two torsion. Um, so we've had the F2, the, the version um, defined over the field of two elements, and then the integral version. So how are these uh, related? Um, well, they're related by a kind of universal coefficient theorem. Um, so, um, so the integral version and the F2 version are related by universal coefficient theorem. And that looks uh, like this. So it's a short exact sequence where you take the, um, here you take the integral version and you tensor it with F2. And then next you take the <coughs> F2 version. And then over here, as in the <coughs> universal, all universal coefficient theorems, you have a, a Tor group and the indexing is like this. You have Kh i plus one of J, here the integral version. Um, and the second entry here is, is F2. So that's the, um, that's the universal coefficient theorem. Now, from this, um, one result that's worth stating is that the uh, integral, the reduced integral Kovanov homology of 
alternating links um, doesn't have any two torsion. And <coughs> the reason I say that is to sort of hammer home the point that I was making before, that um, the two t a lot of, having a lot of two torsion is really a, um, I'm sorry, this is reduced. Having a lot of two torsion is really a phenomenon um, of the unreduced theory rather than the reduced theory. The unreduced theory um, has uh, a lot of two torsion. The proof of this is just looking at the universal coefficient theorem. Um, because well, combining the universal coefficient theorem and that result about alternating links that we saw yesterday. So if, um, if this uh, does have two torsion, then the point is that this is going to show up um, in, in two places when you, when, when you look at this. So... <coughs> If it has two torsion, say, in, in uh, by degree ij, then one place it's going to show up is using the universal coefficient theorem here. So from that bit of the, um, the short exact uh, <coughs> sequence, um, then we can see that the group um, Kh ij f2 is non-zero, or sorry, has two torsion, sorry, has, is non-zero. Um, but also we have a bit of the long exact sequence here, but you see we shift in this, in the first degree here. So that's actually going to give a non-zero group here with i equal, with, with i minus one. Um, so this is by the this is by the red bit, and by the green, we have that the reduced group in uh, degree i minus one j is non-zero by the green bit. But this contradicts the um, result that we had before that there was <coughs> that the homology had to lie on a single line, the result about the signature, because remember we have an alternating knot. So this contradicts the fact that um, j minus 2i is constant, as it turns out it's the signature. Okay, so <coughs> that's... Um, <coughs> one thing about two torsion. Now, um, torsion in general, ha it should be said, is a little bit of a mystery. Um, <coughs> if one looks in the reduced theory, then all kind of torsion is more or less on an equal footing, two torsion and, and odd torsion. There is odd torsion, um, but you have to um, look at reasonably high crossing numbers before you get odd torsion. Um, and some torsion, be it odd or not, is shown in the reduced theory, others in the unreduced theory, um, and any combination of things that you'd like, you can kind of get examples for. Um, up until uh, about two days ago, or three days ago, I thought that the only instances of, th of um, odd torsion um, was on torus knots. Certainly torus knots is the place where odd torsion was first observed. Um, and, but it appears that there is an example, um, so Lukas Levak was telling me about this. Where, where is Lukas actually? Maybe he's not here. Okay. So um, anyway, there's an example which is a three, um, a three braid, uh, which is not a torus uh, knot and um, has, actually I'm not even sure it's a three braid, but there is an example um, which is not a torus knot. Uh, which has um, some odd torsion. So it's not just restricted to the torus knots. And uh, what else can one say about torsion? Well, the torus knots are very interesting, but the 
family T3N, um, that has no odd torsion, so that is known. Okay, so let me now um, uh, move on, and I want to say a small word about the um, construction of Kovana homology. So yesterday I meant to um, ask you to read the construction of Kovana homology as presented by uh, Drawban Atan in his, um, in his article which I cited yesterday, and I would still like you to do that. Um, so I'm going to resist giving you the construction of Kovana homology as much as I possibly can. Um, but what I'm going to do instead is um, I'm going to give you the construction of, a, of something slightly more recent than uh, Kovana homology called odd Kovana homology. And the reason I'm going to do that is because if you haven't yet seen the construction of Kovana homology, which might be about half of you, then this will give you um, a good idea of how to do it because it's very similar, so you can still go off and read Barnatan for yourself. Um, and if you have seen the construction of Kovana homology before, then seeing uh, what happens for this variant odd Kovana homology, you, you might find more, more interesting. So here we are with the construction of odd Kovana homology. Some of the things I'll say will be um, true for more generally. Um, so the first thing we need to know about are um, <coughs> what are called decorated uh, hypercubes or decorated cubes. So <coughs> first of all, what's a, a cube? Well, I take a, an n-dimensional um, hypercube. whose points are in one-to-one -one correspondence with n copies of a, of a two-element set. And I can draw that so it looks like a cube in the following way. So for the case n equals 3, There. So I take this cube and I arrange it so that it has sort of vertices at the extremity. I lie it on its side um, so that I can give some kind of order um, to the cube. If this corresponds to the point um, 0, 0, 0 using these coordinates, then this might be the point 1, 0, 0, and so on. So the reason I've divided the board and two here is because on the left is what you see in most of the sort of traditional literature about Kovana homology, and on the right is um, a way of expressing this that I actually prefer. Um, so in this preferred version, what's an n-dimensional hypercube? Well, you start off with a, um, a set X with n elements. And then you consider the uh, post set of subsets of X. Um, ordered by inclusion. So this <coughs> has a name, this is called a Boolean lattice on the set X. Um, and that's the, that's the same thing as a, as a cube. Um, so for example, if we have the set X is equal to <coughs> A, B, C, then if you write down all the, oops, 
if you write down all the subsets, including the empty one, you've got empty A, B, C, the set A, C, A, B, B, C, and here you've got A, B, C. And if you draw what's called the, the Hasse diagram of this post set, um, so what's the Hasse diagram? So the Hasse diagram, well, if you, you, you draw an edge um, <coughs> from A to B, if A is less than B in the ordering, and there's nothing sitting in between A and B. So here we get something that looks like this. And you see that you get the, the oh, did I miss one? Is there anything missing there? I think it's okay. It's very hard to see when you're close to the board. But is this? Is there? A, is there? A, is there a mistake? Oh, here. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So there's a mistake, but not with the picture. Okay. So that's. Um, how I prefer to look at um, cubes, but they're not just cubes, they're decorated cubes, so what does that mean? So what <coughs> decorating a cube means is that on this side of the board to each vertex of this cube we associate um, an abelian group or vector space depending on where we're working which I'll call uh, f of a and to each edge in your cube, and remember I lay the cube down so that there was some kind of ordering involved. <coughs> so to each edge going from left to right in the picture, um, <coughs> we associate a homomorphism from f of a, so I'll call this dAB, and this goes from the thing we've associated to a to the thing <coughs> we've associated to b. And I must do this in such a way that whenever I see in my, whenever I see a square in my cube, so that whenever I see something that looks like this, So between these, I have these maps, where these maps are. So here there's DAB, DBD, and so on. So the condition is that these uh, two roots around the square agree. Okay, so this composition here is the same as this composition here. Uh, yeah, so my sentence no longer makes sense, so such that... <coughs> Um, squares commute in this sense that I just gave you. Okay, so that's one way of saying it. It's rather easy to understand. Um, but nonetheless, um, what is that in, in these terms here? Um, well, actually, this any poset can be viewed as a category. So uh, BX is a category 
where the objects are just the elements of the, of the post set, um, and there's a unique morphism between any, any two elements uh, that, that are um, where A is less than B. So with unique morphism um, A to B, uh, whenever A is less than or equal to B in the partial order. <coughs> so it's a category. And when we have categories, well, out of categories you can construct functors, and the data given here um, is simply a functor from this category to abelian groups. Okay, so <coughs> what I want to do is to give you an example of a, of a decorated cube. Um, and the example I'm going to give you um, is quite an elaborate example, and it's the thing that defines um, odd Kovana homology. So example, and this is the decorated cube for odd Kovana homology. So we start with um, an oriented link diagram. And we take the, <coughs> the, our n element set, um, which we're going to use to create this a Boolean lattice, to be the set of crossings of this diagram. So x, um, which depends on the, on the diagram, is uh, taken to be um, the set of crossings of D. And so the aim is we want to try and construct a functor uh, FD going from the Boolean lattice on the set, so this cube, to, um, well, abelian groups, but we can do this more generally. Let's assume we have some ring floating around in the background and we'll look at R modules. So let's take um, a subset of the set XD, um, and we have to associate some R module to that. Um, <coughs> and um, the first thing we do is we make something which I'll call a smoothing associated to A. So the smoothing um, associated to A um, is made from the diagram D by making local replacements around each crossing in the following way.
So if I have a negative crossing, this is the crossing C. And the crossing C is not in the subset A. Then I replace this local piece here by a piece that looks like this. Where I have a red arrow going in the direction of the orientation. If C is in the subset A, then I do the following replacement. I replace like this, and I have an arrow going that away. And these red arrows are part of my replacement rule. And for a positive crossing, I have a similar kind of a thing. Um, so if C is not an A, then I replace like this. And if C is an A, then I replace like this. Okay, so given a subset of um, the crossings, um, and I do this procedure at each crossing, I end up with a collection of circles in the plane with red arrows um, at certain points. So an example, if I take a, a trefoil, and I go one, two, three, and I take the set A equals two, um, then I end up with something that looks like this. Uh, maybe I need to give you an orientation to do this. Uh, let me take this. Um, how does this go? There. So you can you can check that and tell me if that's right or not. I, I hope it is. Anyway, you always end up with uh, something that looks uh, somewhat like this. And these red arrows, um, so perhaps this is a remark, these red arrows allow us, if necessary, to order the strands that we see around the crossing. Because you see, in this, um, in the smoothing here, if I, there was a crossing where that red arrow is, if I just look in a little neighborhood of that, um, crossing, then I can say that the tail of the arrow comes before the, the head of the arrow. So it gives me an ordering on the strands. Not a global ordering on the circles, and this example shows you this. Here I've got an arrow going from this circle to this one, and here I've got an arrow going the other way. So I don't get a global ordering on the circles, but I do get a local ordering. So this gives a local ordering on strands uh, near crossings. Okay, so now I have to, um, what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to associate some kind of module to to the subset A. So far I've succeeded in um, making a picture, but then from that picture I, uh, I make a module. So here's what I do. No. Nope. So I define um, F of A to be the uh, exterior algebra, um, the following exterior algebra, um, I take a, a variable x for each circle 
that I see in the picture here. Did I call it the resolution? No, the smoothing. In the smoothing associated to A. So in here, so this is the exterior algebra. So in here, um, x gamma wedge x gamma is zero, and also there's an anti-commutativity. Minus, so x gamma wedge x beta is minus x beta wedge x gamma. So that defines the functor for me on objects. But what about on, on morphisms? Well, to define a functor um, on morphisms, remember there's a unique morphism between any two um, objects. So I only have to define morphisms um, along the edges that I see in this picture, and then they just combine in the, in the, in the only way possible. So what happens if I have a, an edge? So on morphisms, this means when I have an edge going from a subset A to a subset B, what this means is that B contains one more element than A. So the size of B is the size of A uh, plus one. So I have an additional uh, crossing. So near the additional crossing in B, uh, what do I see? Well, let me see if those <coughs> pictures are still there. Ah, did I erase it? I oh, know, they're there on the top of the board. Okay, very good. So. You still see the rules, okay? So what's happened is that there's an additional crossing, let's call it C. So near C, when I look at the picture associated to A and the picture associated to B, then something that looked like it was on the left um, of the assignment rules has turned into the thing that was on the right of the assignment rules. So the local change, so near the additional crossing C and B, um, the local change looks like this. You have here a strand alpha and here a strand alpha prime. They may be the same, but I want to <coughs> just give them different names. And I have an arrow uh, going up. And this goes to picture that looks like this, where I'll call them beta and beta prime, um, and I have an arrow that goes like this. So this is A, and this is B. And I guess that the, the top picture looks exactly like that if I have a negative crossing. If I have a positive crossing, then you need to rotate these pictures to the right um, or your head to the left to get the, the appropriate picture. So if that's what the thing looks like, how does this change the associated um, modules, which are exterior algebras?
Oh, <laughs> excellent. So I'd like to say that I made it wrong on purpose in order to have some elaborate plan for the rest of the lecture, but I'm afraid I can't. If it's wrong, it's just wrong. No, I'm not going to use that example. So which, what's wrong? Did I just use the wrong orientation? Okay. Well, if anyone else works it out and um, gets a different answer, then we can present the answers, and at the end we can do mathematics by democracy and vote on what's the, <laughs> what's the correct one. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're looking at this local change. Now, there are two um, cases to consider here, and that's to do with whether alpha and alpha prime are actually the same component, in the same component or not. So the first case... Um, is when alpha is different from alpha prime. So that means that in the, in the smoothing, uh, this goes away somewhere and comes back and goes away somewhere and comes back. So over here in the, in the changed picture, this goes away and so forth. So you see that if alpha and alpha prime are different on the left, then beta and beta prime are the same on the right. So in this case, um, we do the following thing. Um, So I'll just use this notation. It's the, <coughs> the morphism associated to this edge. What it does is it's the algebra map uh, given by, well, I'm going to send 1 to 1. I'm going to send x alpha and x beat, uh, sorry, and x alpha prime. So remember, I have a, a generator for each circle that I see. I'm going to send those to uh, x beta. And for all the others, I'm just going to let them be as they were. So this is for gamma not equal to uh, alpha alpha prime. Now case two So this is if alpha is equal to alpha prime. And what that means is that beta is different from beta prime. So I am, um, here I'm somehow the same. So I go around and come back. So here they're different. So then I define this, <coughs> the map. to be the module map uh, given as follows. So if I have something that looks like x, if I see x alpha, so x alpha wedge some other v, um, then I send that to x beta wedge x beta prime uh, wedge v. And here, I am carefully writing beta before beta prime, you note, because I actually have an order on beta and beta prime. And I send anything else, so if I don't see x alpha, then I send this to um, x beta minus x beta prime, uh, wedge v. So this is where x alpha is absent from v. So note 
that I have used the fact that I have this ordering. There is an asymmetry. So in the, in the first case, this case here, in fact, I didn't use any ordering at all. But over here, I have used the structure of these additional red arrows um, to be able to write this in this order, and here I've even got a minus x beta minus x uh, beta prime. Good. So one remark about this is that if R happens to be F2, so yeah, so this this means the field on two elements for me. It meant yesterday it meant the free group, um, but today it means the. F In fact, Robert already used it, meaning the the field of two elements. So, <coughs> so if we work over this over this field, then what? what happens, well then you see the exterior algebra um, that we looked at before. Um, well now it's over F2. So we've got X gamma for gamma circle. Um, but now we can just think of this as the polynomial algebra where we get rid of all squares. So this is the same thing if you want, as the tensor product over gamma a circle in this moving of this algebra here. And the notation would be that in the exterior algebra, if I write something as x gamma, then I would, this would correspond in this over here to something that would be maybe one tensor one tensor 1, tensor x gamma in the appropriate spot, the tensor factor corresponding to the circle, um, and so on. So the reason I, I'm saying that is because if you already know the construction of good old Kovana homology, um, then you'll recognize that, I mean, that's the thing you use, okay? And moreover, if you're working over F2, you can check that these maps I've defined for you here. So this is in the case you've already read uh, about the construction of Kovana homology. So those maps over F2 correspond to the maps that you know and love um, in the construction of Kovana homology. So the construction I'm doing here over F2 is exactly the same as the, as the usual one. But it's different if we're not working over F2 because of this asymmetry. So we're still missing something. We're trying to make a functor. So far we've got objects assigned to um, modules. We've got edges. Um, we've assigned to edges some, some maps. Um, but we don't know that composition uh, works well. So we have to look at what happens over squares. So if we consider a square, like this, then actually a number of things can happen. So this is unlike the case of Kovanov homology where it's actually rather, rather simple. So what can happen in this case is that um, so either we have that uh, D B C follows D A B is equal to D the other way around. Um, so either that or it can be that 
one way around is minus the other way around. Or both can be zero. So some examples of this. Um, if you have something like this, then you'll be in a case like this. And if you have the two going the same way, it's not clear. There's some, you have to do a little calculation to see that, but that should, be, should give you an example of this. So the problem, of course, is that a priori, you don't know quite what, what does what, and it's to do with the combinatorics of these maps. Um, but fortunately, um, all is well. And there's the following proposition, which is <coughs> there exists a signage making squares commute. So by a signage, I mean a function from the, the edges to uh, Z2. And by making the squares commute, I mean what you do is um, you adjust, uh, so you modify, well, actually, I guess this is, this is the, what I mean by making the squares commute. So you modify um, DAB to be minus 1 to the power epsilon of the edge AB times DAB. And if you do that, then all squares commute. But it is non-trivial. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It's non-trivial to show that that's the case. And I should have said all this um, is due to um, Osvath, Rasmussen, and uh, Zabo, so the reference here is Osvath, Rasmussen, Zabo, uh, and it's 0710 But there's also um, a paper by Shumakovic, so this is not the paper that I was telling you about yesterday. Um, it's another one which is about odd Kovanov homology, which is also um, well worth a look. So Shumakovich. And that's 1101 Okay, so now out of all of this then, now that we have this signage, signage we finally constructed um, so out of all of this, we finally have a functor, which I'll call uh, f uh, odd. Do I want to call it that? Yeah, so it's f odd. Depends on the diagram, and it goes from b x d to r modules. Okay, so that's the end of that example. Remember all of this, I started by saying I want to give you an example of a decorated hypercube. Well, now I've done it. So that's the end of that example. Of course, there are far easier examples to give, but this is, this is the interesting one. So now that we have such a, such a functor, how do we get any information out of this thing? And the answer to that is that you make a chain complex, which again you can read about in uh, Barnatan's paper. I'll just very briefly tell you what you do. I'm sorry? Lift the blank backboard, yes. I 
I guess that's not quite what you meant. <laughs> So given such a functor, you can uh, make a, a cochain complex in the following way. So we extract information <coughs> from functors of this form. So going from some bx to wherever um, in the following way. <coughs> so you, I'll just... Really, I want to be brief about this. So you have your cube. Like this. And associated to every vertex, you have a, uh, an abelian group. So here's one, and here's one, and so on. And you have every time you see um, an edge, you have an associated map. What you then do, and this is the process which is known as flattening the cube in the paper of Barnatan and elsewhere, is you then take the direct sum of everything you see lined up like this in terms of process that corresponds to taking each uh, subset which has a fixed number of elements, and you take the direct sum of everything you have there. So the ith, well, I guess this is the first one, but the ith uh, chain group is the direct sum of all the fa uh, where the size of a is equal to i. And then to get from here to c i plus 1, because you need a differential, we're supposed to be making a cochain complex. I didn't say that by building a cochain complex. How do you get the differential if this is the direct sum of things b of size i plus 1? Well, between any given a here and any given b here, you have a map dab. So you just use those as matrix elements for this map. So this map here, this D, has matrix elements. Uh, D, A, B. Now, as it stands, um, this map D is 0 mod 2. Um, but you can adjust by using a, a different signage to the one I talked about before to make sure that it's zero integrally. So as it stands, so D is uh, zero mod two. Um, with addition of a signage, Um, it's, it is actually zero. D squared, I'm sorry. Thank you. D squared. Yeah, thanks. So the definition of <coughs> odd Kovana homology is that you do that to the functor that we constructed before.
definition of odd covalent homology is that KH I odd of D using the ring R, coefficients in R, is the I homology of the coche of the complex that we just made. So one thing that is missing from this picture is in the first lecture, Kovana homology, and so probably its variance like this should be bigraded. Um, and I haven't talked about the bigrading at all, but that can be put back in. So the remark is that um, if f odd or any of these functors takes values in graded abelian groups or graded vector spaces, then you get an additional um, grading. So if this takes values in graded abelian groups, um, then the associated complex is bigraded. And for completeness, let me tell you what the bigrading is for odd Kovana homology. So, um, so if <coughs> we have a, a subset A of the set of crossings, um, then the element or an element V inside the, the kth um, part of the exterior algebra. Um, this defines a chain. Why? Because, well, you just take the direct sum of all these things. So this defines a chain, or a cochain, um, defines a cochain with bigrading Well, you take the number of elements in A, subtract off the... So I'm defining this for you. There's no reason you should do this other than this is the thing that works for you at the end of the day. You take off the number of negative crossings in your diagram, and then the second grading is, looks like this. So double bar or A, this means the, the number of connected components of the smoothing associated to A. So in other words, it's the number of circles seen in the smoothing. So the number of circles in smoothing. Um, and then you add on the number of elements of A plus the number of positive crossings minus twice the number of negative crossings minus 2K. Remember, we started out with an element in lambda K. So that's the migrating that you, that you take. If you do take this, then as an exercise, you can work out what the bigrading of the two generators um, associated to the unknotted diagram of the unknot R. You'll see that the answer is 0, 1, and 0, minus 1. Maybe I should talk until 12.45. Um, no, no, I won't do that. Okay, well, I'll just carry on. Um, yes. Okay, so let me carry on with a um, summarizing some of the 
the, the properties of, of odd Kovalev homology. First of all, there are long exact sequences, skein long exact sequences, like there were before. And when I say as before, I really mean that with the same indices. Moreover, you get the Jones polynomial back as you did before. And there's a reduced version. And the thing that's interesting about the reduced version is that it stands in the same relationship to the unreduced version as the reduced version of the mod 2 Kovalev homology does to the unreduced version of the mod 2 Kovalev homology. So what that means is that kh ij odd is isomorphic to reduced k i j plus one odd plus another copy with second degree j minus one. So this is like what we had for the mod two Kovana homology. Um, in other words, it's the reduced and un the relationship is very simple between reduced and unreduced. But this was unlike the case for um, the uh, the integral uh, integral Kovana homology, where we had to relate these things using a long exact sequence. And then <coughs> for alternating knots. Um, the odd Kovanov homology is actually the same as the, the ordinary one. But in general, this is <coughs> not true. One neither determines the other or is determined by the other. Okay, so in general, um, these two theories, the odd Kovana homology and the, the ordinary Kovana homology, um, are, um, are different things. So perhaps I should finish with some, uh, just some remarks. Um, first remark is that <coughs> uh, in uh, his third or fourth lecture, I forget which, Robert promised that he'd tell us about the spectral sequence which goes from um, Kovana homology to the Hegard Fleur homology of the um, double branch double cover. So he said he'd talk about that. Now perhaps he will tell us about the F2 version. So the F2 version of that is a spectral sequence which at the E2 page has um, Kovana homology, and then it converges to, as I said, the Hegard flow homology of the, <coughs> the double cover. Now, if you want to do this integrally, then the conjectured replacement of this, and I think it's still conjectural, and maybe now it's been, been shown to be the right thing, but if you want to do this integrally, the right thing to replace the 
here, the E2 term with, is not the integral Kovana homology, but it's odd Kovana homology. And this was one of the main motivations for, um, <coughs> those, for the three authors to define odd Kovana homology. So that's one remark. Um, the next remark is that there are other um, spectral sequences which are interesting, which start with odd Kovana homology. So I've written some of those down in the, in the notes. Maybe I can't, I don't have the time to, have, to give any details, but there's one by Bier which has uh, got this number, um, where he has a spectral sequence which starts with odd Kovana homology and ends up with some other um, version of some not homology defined by Zabo. And there's another one, um, Scaduto 1401 which again starts with odd Kovana homology and ends up with some other um, kind of not homology. Um, <coughs> so it does appear um, in, all, in all sorts of places. Ah, yes. So the other um, thing I wanted to remark I wanted to make is that there's a paper by Bloom which does an interesting thing. You see, if you think about those smoothings, I guess they've, they've gone now, but we had circles and we had arrows. You could think of changing things around and making a graph out of this. And the graph you would make has got vertices as the, um, the, the circles and the arrows are directed arrows in a directed graph. And so you can try and think about constructing odd Kovana homology just from that point of view. And, um, that's done in there. Um, okay. Well, I have, yeah, so I have three minutes remaining, which isn't long, but I, w I do want to say one more thing, actually. Um, and in a way, this is <coughs> for, for experts. So if you're not an expert, then you can just sit there having whatever pleasant thoughts you wish to have maybe France winning the World Cup or something like that. So, maybe France losing the World Cup. <laughs> um, so the remark is this, is it's simply that there are other ways of extracting, maybe I won't write anything, maybe I'll just um, refer you to, to, to the notes, but I do want to say something. There are other ways of, of extracting um, information from the decorated cube. And you see this business with the, with the posets. Posets equipped with functors are not unknown objects in mathematics. And there's a very natural way of um, taking cohomology of these things. And um, if you, you have to make a modification to the, to the, to the POSET. I'm presenting this because I rather like it and because it's due to me. But um, what you have to do is you have to add an additional element here to your, to your POSET and you have to uh, is suitably extend the, the functor with something trivial here. But if you do that, then there really is a very, very standard thing to do. Um, once you have a functor, let's call this POSET Q. If you have a functor from Q to, say, abelian groups, there's a very standard thing uh, to do. And it looks scary, and I'm not going to say anything about it, but it's this. You can think about the inverse limit functor and of this over Q, and you can take its right-derived functors. Now, really, this, it would take too long, but the reason I want to push this point of view is, if you like, by analogy. If you think of group cohomology, okay, so if, if you know what that is, then there are two approaches to group cohomology. If you're giving a course, you could give one of two possible definitions. One definition is you take your group and you make an explicit complex using the bar resolution or something. It's very, very explicit, nice to work with, and so forth. But what you could also do is you could define it as the derived functors of something. And each approach has its merits. If you define it explicitly, then the derived functors approach some tall group. That's then a, an interpretation, if you like. If you define it in terms of the derived functors, then the other one becomes a calculation. And each point of view has its uses. And for defining Kovana homology, which 
I actually haven't done, but um, I did odd Kavana homology. For any of these things, the version of the definition that we have is very much the explicit one. Okay, so even though this looks a lot scarier, um, it really could have its uses, or it could be something that's worth knowing, um, in the same way that it's useful to know that group cohomology is defined or can be defined in terms of derived functors. I'll stop there for today. <laughs>